Hello and welcome to episode 10 of Medical Today with me, Jared Rudnam. And uh, in our first segment, we usually talk about aging and uh, wellness, of course, to join us on the show. We always have Dr. Navendra Nagaswaran, who is from Global Doctors. He's joining us uh, on a weekly basis. And we have a special guest today, Tantri Dr. Muhammad Ismail Merikan. He's a consultant hepatologist and internal medicine specialist from Prince Court Medical Center. But if you know this man well, you know that he's the former Director General of the Health Ministry in Malaysia. He joins us to talk about liver health. Thank you very much for taking time off, uh, Tansri, to join us. Uh, they say uh, us Indians have a very strong liver. I don't know if that's true <laughs> <laughs> because of our extracurricular activities. But uh, we'll leave that for another discussion. Dr. Navin, thank you very much for joining us okay. again. Yes. Now, with liver health, before we get into uh, grilling Tansri, uh, where do we begin with this uh, I think one of the first things that we want to talk about is drug-induced liver disease. Mm -hmm. And liver is a very important component as we grow older. Life expectancy in Malaysia is in the 70s. And our aging population is also increasing by 2030. So something that Tantri would like to comment on drug-induced liver disease. Where do we begin? <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, uh, that is a very important issue, these drug-induced liver diseases, because as you grow older, the liver decreases in volume and also in blood flow. Mm -hmm. And uh, so most of the older population, they are prone to drug-induced liver diseases. So what I'm trying to say is, a lot of us do take drugs or supplements at our whims and fancies. Or sometimes we go to the supermarket and somebody tells us this is good for you, take it. So my... Um, caution to our people in Malaysia is to be very uh, careful about what they consume right. because the liver is like a factory so everything that you take goes to the liver so well, as you grow older a couple of hundred functions of the yeah, liver in yeah itself. as you grow older you tend to get these drug related in liver diseases recently we had one Chinese gentleman who came with severe jaundice and pruritus and all that and of course most of them do not tell us what they have consumed for fear of reprisal, mm -hmm. you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. But you have to get a proper history and you, the patients, must be prepared to tell us what they have been taking in order for us to get to the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So more often than not, we find that they have been taking certain uh, drugs or supplements that uh, may have affected their liver function. So when I say that, there are two issues actually. One is uh, the idiosyncratic drug reaction, which you cannot help. The other one is uh, related to the dose that you take. So it's better for you to go and see a doctor, get a proper prescription for whatever malady that you have, and uh, so that you don't steer away from taking unnecessary drugs <coughs> or supplements. Right, but, but therein lies the problem. You, you're talking about this person goes to a supermarket and goes to a pharmacy there and someone says take this and people buy it and take it. Now how are we giving, uh, giving authority to these people to tell us what to take in supermarkets and pharmacies? Well, they've got every right to tell you what to take. Mm -hmm. I mean, they say, oh, you don't look good today. I mean, you look funny or, you know, you can, we can make you yeah, look beautiful exactly. and all right. that. Right. So we are all very vain people, aren't we? So Some if, of us. if I come up with an ad saying, if you're feeling fatigued, take something for your liver. We've got a special supplement. Yeah, you have the right people to say whatever yeah. you like. Yeah. But it's up to you to decide whether you should take it or not. Right. And that is why you need proper advice for that. Mm, okay, so that's where you gentlemen come yeah. in. Dr. Navin. Usually, I mean, there are people who take a cup load of medicines. Mm -hmm. If you're eating well, you're, hi you're hydrating yourself well, you really don't need all yes. the supplements. Maybe one or two of the yes. supplements will ask Tansri which is the right one right. to take. But you don't need a handful of A, yeah. B, C, everything put together in a cup. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, it's more like a meal, you know. Yeah. So maybe Tansri, you tell us which is the best my, do you recommend. My, well, different people have got different <laughs> ideas on yeah. me, but my principle is very simple. I mean, if you are consuming a normal diet, mm -hmm. then there's no need to take any more supplements. Yeah. But as you grow older, you may need some uh, added supplements to try to keep you, you know, robust yes. as you mm -hmm. grow older. And these are things like vitamin C, calcium, vitamin C, maybe omega-3 fish oil, CQ10. That's about all. Okay, if, mm -hmm. if you were to bring it down or narrow it down for everyone across the board, the to three supplements that uh, everyone should have? 
Well, that is a very simplistic uh, question. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah. if I were the person, I would certainly like to take vitamin C, mm -hmm. at least one gram yeah. a day. Vitamin D and calcium is very important. And omega-3 fish oil to bring down the triglycerides. Mm -hmm. So uh, right. there they have exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and while you're talking mm -hmm. about this, what about um, like preventive? Because these are preventive health. What about vaccines? To Vaccine to me is very, very important. Why? Because, well, we have got uh, two vaccines in Malaysia related to liver diseases. There is hepatitis A vaccine and the hepatitis B vaccine. Now, hepatitis A vaccine is important mm -hmm. because if you do not have the antibodies and say you're an elderly and you get inflicted with hepatitis A, mm -hmm. the risk of you getting severe complications from the hepatitis A can be quite devastating. Okay. A lot more older people with hepatitis A end up in the hospital, they stay very long in the hospital, they get very itchy, they get very sick, and the quality of life goes down. Yeah. So why should we subject ourselves to that kind That's of true. disease? Mm -hmm. Just go for a vaccine. But before you go for the vaccination, it is good to check whether you already have antibodies, the antibodies to hepatitis A or not. On your blood because tests, in yeah. Malaysia, with the Chakwetia <coughs> and all that, yeah. Some of you may get a hepatitis A naturally. Yes. So you already got it's antibodies. coming from the oysters. Mm -hmm. and the so you don't need the vaccine. Right. That's for hepatitis A. Yeah. Now for hepatitis B, it is so, so important because it is one of the vaccines that can prevent hepatitis B associated liver cancer. Most of the liver cancer that you see in this part of the world is associated with hepatitis B. So if you, keep prevent, if you can prevent hepatitis B, yeah. you can prevent hep uh, liver cancer. But a lot of people do not do that. They mm -hmm. just don't bother about getting themselves vaccinated against hepatitis B. Mm -hmm. That is probably because they feel that it is not necessary. Mm -hmm. Well, all health personnel and those who work in the labs will have to yep, take, take it, the yes. vaccine. But those who are not, they feel that the risk is very low, so they don't That's need right. to take. But remember, we have had so many cases of liver ca cancer coming to us without them realizing that they had mm -hmm. liver cancer. So but everyone's very, coming, but a bit too late. Yeah, but when you look at the history, they've had hepatitis B all their life. Right. We're going to take a short break. We're going to come back, yeah. continue with this. We also want to talk about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and uh, some of the problems with regards to the liver. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with more information right here on Medical Day. I have a vision correction number, but I'm more than a number. When I'm not enjoying my little sunshine, I'm enjoying my city's modern architecture. My Estelor lenses go beyond my correction. Their creasel technology shields my eyes from reflections, scratches and smudges for optimal clarity. I'm more than a number. I'm a crystal clear catcher of the perfect image. See more, do more. Estelor. Ask your eye care expert for advice. I have a vision correction number, but I'm more than a number. When I'm not sharing ideas with my colleagues, I'm defending my kingdom on the back of a dragon. My eyes and lenses go beyond my correction. They keep my eyes relaxed to stay focused and protect me from harmful blue light. I'm more than a number. I'm the never tired dragon eye. Eyes in. Ask your eye care professional. See more. Do more. Essilor. Hello and welcome back to Medical Day. We're currently discussing ageing and liver health. We're joined by Tan Sri Dr. Mohammad Ismail Marikan and our usual suspect, Dr. Navindra Nagaswar. And Dr. Navin, you were about to move into uh, fatty liver disease. Yeah. Yeah. Fatty liver is something that we regularly see in the primary care perspective. We, when you do the medical checkups, we see the liver enzymes high. When you do a simple ultrasound, we see fatty liver. But after that, the, prog the progression is always depends on lifestyle change. But Tantri, you can give some comment. What are the risks? Yes. Fatty liver is becoming the most common liver disease in the world. Yeah. In Malaysia, I think 60% of our population is either overweight or obese. Mm -hmm. so that puts them at risk. 
there are certain people who are more at risk to get fatty liver than others. Mm. These are people who are diabetics, hypertensive, those with cholesterol problems, those who are overweight, those who are obese, don't do exercise, etc. etc. Now, if you ask the average doctor, if you say the person got fatty liver, ah, it's okay, no yes, problem, no issue. You know, yeah. but <laughs> yes, exactly. This is my concern. Yeah. Because with fatty liver, you do have to go for another test, which is called a fibro scan. Mm -hmm. And with that test, you'll be able to see whether the liver is stiff or not. And if the liver is stiff, you need to do something about it. You know, of course. Can something be done about it? It can, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But a lot depends on you, on that particular person. Yes. yes. First, of course, dietary modification, exercise. If you are diabetic, make sure your diabetes is well controlled. If you are hypertensive or you have cholesterol problems, make sure those issues are well con controlled. Without controlling any of this, you are not going to get rid of your fatty liver. And with fatty liver, you can go on to get chronic liver disease like cirrhosis and even liver cancer. Mm -hmm. So that's the concern of it. We have had so many patients come into us with cirrhosis of unknown etiology. But when you look further, you know that the cause is actually fatty liver. So when, when you say uh, with fatty liver, uh, when the liver becomes stiff, are there any signs and symptoms that your liver has become stiff? No. No. None. None, none at all. That's right. This so, becomes so a problem. I mean, you go to see a doctor, executive yeah. screen, see Dr. Navin, and you find the enzymes are elevated, mm -hmm. and, or maybe do an ultrasound and find it's a bit bright liver, they send to you. That's all. That's and it. you'll be surprised. Yeah. Oh, you, have I got fatty liver? Why, why, why? You know? Mm -hmm. So... So it's a lot of time that you need to spend with them too. Yeah. You need to spend time, advise them. You just cannot poo-poo it. Yeah. yeah. That's but, what but I'm trying to say. I have uh, spoken to people who said, oh, my doctor said I have a fatty liver disease, but what else did he say? That's it. That's it. Because That's it. Yeah. probably they are not aware of <coughs> the things that need to be said. Right. Yeah. So if I, if I were to see a patient with a fatty liver, I will spend some time can talking to the patient. Can you reverse a fatty liver disease? Non you can. You can. You can. Yeah. Liver Certainly is all can. reversible. Yeah. Yes. That's the best part about the liver. That is the good news. Mm -hmm. The bad news is you ignore the fatty liver, allow it to go to cirrhosis and liver cancer. That's the bad news. Then the yes, good news is it can be reversed. But a lot depends on you. Mm -hmm. In lifestyle changes. Yes, right. Yeah. Right. From there, let's talk about liver cirrhosis. Right. Uh, liver cirrhosis is something that's not very much talked about. Yeah. Um, I know of uh, friends' fathers who have died of liver cirrhosis. And uh, how bad is the problem now in Malaysia? Liver cirrhosis is a sort of end stage of liver disease. You know? mm -hmm. And uh, if you have liver cirrhosis, your liver is shrunken or scarred, then you are at risk of getting certain complications, which are more common than if you don't have cirrhosis. What are these complications? Mm -hmm. You can get bleeding from variceal bleeding. You know, so that means you need to do a scope to find out whether you've got varices if you have cirrhosis. Because if you don't do that, then you wake up one morning, you suddenly vomit out blood and you're wondering why. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. Number two is ascites and fluid. The abdomen gets distended. And you're wondering why am I you know, getting a distended abdomen? You think maybe the food that I took last night or something. Mm -hmm. But it's actually fluid. Ascites, you call it. That's the second thing. The third thing, of course, is the fact that they can go into liver cancer. They can get liver cancer. Once your liver is cirrhotic, the risk of getting liver cancer is pretty high. Mm -hmm. So we have to follow them up every three to six months to find out whether there's anything in the liver from the ultrasound and do a tumor marker called alpha fetoproteins to find out whether it is raised or not. Right. A at your level, um, how do you, b before a patient even gets to someone like Tansri, they have to see primary health care. Yes. Now, at primary health care or at family medicine level, uh, where, when do you know that alarm bells are ringing and you need to refer them to someone like Tansu? Mostly, uh, most of the time when you look at the liver enzymes, they already give you an indication. Secondly, and then you repeat the liver enzymes in two to three months and you don't see changes in their lifestyle, then you need to actually send them, or how long they've been actually having the problem, then you need to send them for further um, investigations. You can't just leave them, like what Tantri said, you know, just ignore it and say, it's okay, just change your diet. I had cases of patients who actually take an initiative. Within six months, he transformed his whole liver enzyme and he made it back to completely normal by just changing the lifestyle. But you need to explain and spend time with them. If right. I may add to that, you need not have abnormal liver enzymes to have cirrhosis. That is the danger. Mm -hmm. yeah. So now, you have to be very careful. Right. I, I mean, what, what would be your parting message to all of us with regards to uh, liver, the protection of the liver and understanding liver problems? Well, in the first place, you make sure that whatever you take uh, drugs or supplements, you're guided by a medical practitioner, all right? And don't get swayed by the internet yes. or whatever, whoever you meet in the supermarket. Dr. Google. 
Number two, if there are vaccines that you can take, please take the vaccine. And three, go for annual checkups and make sure that everything is hunky-dory. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, yeah. you get surprises. Yes, we right. don't want surprises. <laughs> right. So we don't want surprises, and we want for everything to be hunky-dory when it comes to the liver because it has That's a lot a of work to do message. <laughs> within the body. We'd like to thank Tansi Dr. Mohamed Ismail Marikan for taking time off his very, very busy schedule to join us right here on Medical Day. Thank you very much Thank you. for joining us, uh, Tansri. And one of the best DGs in town. <laughs> one of the best DGs in town, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, stay with us. We're going to take a commercial and we're going to come back and give you more right here on Medical Today. I have a vision correction number, but I'm more than a number. When I'm not teaching courses, I'm taking steeper grades and tight corners. My SLR lenses go beyond my correction. They make my vision as sharp as my reflexes to capture every detail from near to far at any speed. I'm more than a number. I'm a rapidly focusing champion of courses. See more, do more. SLR. Ask your eye care expert for advice. I have a vision correction number, but I'm more than a number. When I'm not enjoying my little sunshine, I'm enjoying my city's modern architecture. My Essilor lenses go beyond my correction. Their creasel technology shields my eyes from reflections, scratches and smudges for optimal clarity. I'm more than a number. I'm a crystal clear catcher of the perfect image. See more, do more. Essilor. Ask your eye care expert for advice. Hello and welcome back to Medical Today with me, Jared Rutnam. This is episode 10, season 2 on BNC. Well, from what we're talking about, we're talking about liver health. We now move into neuroscience managing stroke patients. Now, I don't know if you know this, but stroke no longer affects those above 50. It, in fact, it does happen at any age. And studies are now showing that it happens more to younger people than uh, people who are older. So this is a cause for worry. Now to talk about this, we have our on-site host, Nuratha Amin, speaking to Dr. Go Kwang Hee, a resident consultant in neurology and internal medicine with a special interest in Parkinson's disease and movement disorders. We also have a stroke uh, patient or strokey or someone who's uh, endured a stroke uh, joined by Hamswani, who is a physiotherapist, all talking about managing a stroke patient or managing life after stroke. Let's take a look at this interview. Hello, Dr. Go. Thank you for joining us on Medical Today. So now we're going to talk about stroke, sure. the prevention and physiotherapy. But first of all, what is stroke? Stroke basically is a medical emergency in which poor blood flow to the brain resulting in cell death. Stroke can be divided into two types. One will be ischemic stroke, the other type is hemorrhagic stroke. Ischemic stroke occurs basically lack of blood flow to the brain resulting in cell death, while hemorrhagic stroke occurs because of bleeding inside the brain. So at what age does it occur? Well, stroke can occur at any age, as young as children, as, and the older you are, the higher the risk of getting a stroke. The risk of getting a stroke more than doubles for a decade after age of 55. So what are the risk factors for stroke? The risk factor can be divided into modifiable risk factor and non-modifiable risk factor. Something that you can't modify is your age. The older you are, the higher the risk of getting a stroke. For those with a family history of stroke, the risk of getting a stroke also will be higher. For modifiable, that what we can change will be your diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, lifestyle like smoking, heavy alcohol consumption, sedentary lifestyle, and for those patients with heart problem, irregular heart rhythm, what we call atrial fibrillation, the risk of getting a stroke will be higher compared to those without. All right. So who are prone to this, men or women? 
Well, the incidence of stroke is higher in men from the age up to 74. After age of 70, from age of 75 to 84, incidence of stroke is similar between men and women. But after age of 85, the incidence of stroke is higher in female patients. Right. So how do you rule out a stroke? We suspect stroke based on clinical history. Someone having a stroke will have sudden onset of symptom. Sudden onset because all this happened suddenly because of disruption of the blood flow. So a stroke patient will have sudden onset of either numbness or weakness in their face, their arms, their legs, usually in one side of their body. They can have problem in terms of talking, either understanding the language or having difficulty in expressing themselves. They will have difficulty in balance, meaning they can't walk well, they feel unsteady. They can have problem with their vision, either in one or both eyes. And they can have severe headache, usually in hemorrhagic stroke. From the symptom itself, we can't differentiate whether it's hemorrhagic or, his, or ischemic stroke. So the, after they take a history, the treating doctor will examine the patient and then they will follow by a scan, either a CT scan of the brain and usually will be adequate. For a small stroke or stroke involving the, what we call a brainstem area, MRI scan on the brain will be better. All right. So the early recognitions of signs of a stroke is important, yes, doctor? It's definitely important in the sense that early treatment of the stroke will help to deduce the disability and can save life. So how to, as there's so many symptoms of stroke, in order for public to pick up stroke easier, we come up with the FAST, the FAST, as acronym, as, a, as acronym for pneumonic to pick up stroke and increase the responsiveness of stroke. Whereby the FAST, F stands for face, we ask the patient to smile and then see any drooping of their, their one side of their mouth, or their face can't move well. Ask them to lift up both of their arm to see any weakness of one side of their arm and the S stands for, sorry, A just stands for arm, S stands for speech, talk to them whether they have any problem in speaking or understanding. And the last T stands for time, time to call for ambulance so that they can send to the nearest hospital. For ischemic stroke, we need to give the treatment as early as possible to ensure a better outcome. There are medication we call artiplase or what can be simplified a clot blasting medication whereby it will resolve the clot inside the blood vessel and hence it will improve the blood flow to the brain. The earlier you give the medication, the better the outcome. So it needs to be given ideally, it must be given within first 4.5 hours from onset of stroke. By doing so, there's 30% more likelihood to have functional independence for the stroke survivor. And every one minute loss, you will lose 10 million of cell, brain cell, meaning without treatment. So the longer you wait, not getting a treatment, the survivor, the outcome will be poorer, the more disability. So what are the strategies to reduce risk of having a stroke? So prevention of stroke itself actually can divide it into primary prevention, whereby a person haven't getting a stroke, but will maximize the risk factor to get us, to deduce the risk of getting a stroke. For example, they have to control their blood pressure, control their sugar, control their cholesterol, and having a healthy lifestyle, including exercise, about three to five times in the week, each time for about 20 to 30 minutes. Stop smoking, stop heavy alcohol consumption. For those who have already a stroke, they have to make sure all this primary strategy was being taken care of. On top of that, they have to make sure they take a blood thinner medication. It can be either anti pellet medication, the usual one will be aspirin, or anticoagulation for those with an abnormal irregular heart rhythm, which will be either warfarin or some other medication. And for all the ischemic stroke patients, I will encourage them to take the medication called statin. That's a cholesterol lowering medication, regardless of their cholesterol, whether it's normal or it's high. Right. So, doctor, is stroke a disability? Well, stroke can cause disability and in fact can cause death. So, but if you get the treatment earlier, 
on time, as I say, is 4.5 hours the golden period, the chances to get to be recovered will be better. The earlier from the onset of the stroke to the onset to, to the time we give the medication, if you're given within first 90 minutes from the onset of stroke, the chances of getting recovered up to normal or near normal is very high. In fact, for those patients we've given treatment earlier, first 90 minutes, I treat about four or five patients that I treat, one will get to normal or near normal. The later you are, the chances will be lower. Right. So can you share with us the behavioural changes after a stroke? Yeah, because our behaviour and emotion actually is controlled by the brain. So any brain damage that can cause behavioural changes to the patient, it can cause memory problems as well. Some patients after multiple stroke, their memory were getting worse. And because of the disability from the stroke, after a stroke, some of the patient doesn't recover that well, they will have a lot of trouble in the sense that they will feel stressed, they feel hopeless in the sense that they become a burden to the family. So there are wor a lot of worry and a lot of financial burden on top. So some of the patients might go into depression. Okay, so does stroke rehabilitation play an important role for recuperating? Sure. Stroke rehab is definitely important in a sense to help the stroke survivor to live as independently as possible by adjusting their, dis by their disability. Earlier, the treatment, of course, better the outcome. For those who haven't received the treatment, of course, they might have some disability, but which will improve if they have an early rehabilitation. So the stroke survivor might require a speech therapist because some of the stroke patients after a the stroke, they have difficulty in understanding or talking. So the speech therapist will help them in terms of talking and communicating. Stroke survivor also will need a physiotherapist which will help them to build up their strength, their movement, their coordination and their balance. Some of the patients, stroke survivor also will require Re occupational therapies. What can occupational therapies do is to help them to learn the skill for activity or daily living, which including simple things, dressing, eating, so they can modify certain equipment to help them to cope better despite their disability. Some patients also might need a counsellor or psychiatrist input in the sense that for those with depression, so you need to be emotionally supported and treated. Not to forget about the family as well, because the caretaker will play an important role in terms of rehabilitation and supporting the patient through this journey of stroke. All right. So based on your experience, doctor, um, how long does the recovery process take for recovery most patients? Recovery process, the best recovery will within the first three months will be more prominent. So the the earlier you get the rehab, so that the, the first three months after the onset of stroke will be better. They might still, after the first three months, they might still recover, but the, the rate of recovery might be a bit slower. If they don't recover after six months, usually the disability can be permanent. Mm -mm. And it's also depending on the patient itself. Yes. How they actually... So that's why we need to support them through, yes. have to make sure they go for facial mm -mm. and doing the exercise, control the all the risk factors so that they didn't get another stroke. Okay. So what would you suggest for the food intake and uh, what would you recommend for the diet? So generally healthy diet will be important in the sense that we have to increase the intake of vegetable, intake of fruits as well and high fiber diet. So any vegetable is fine and at the same time we need to cut down salty food, high calorie food like your, if your rice intake is a lot, fast food, all these were resulting in high calorie, high sugar, resulting in obesity. All these are the risk factors to get a stroke. Okay. So, Doctor, what would your advice be to stroke patients who have recovered? Before we advise a stroke patient, I think the more important things is to prevent yourself to, from getting a stroke. Right. So, in, in terms of preventing yourself from getting a stroke, you need a healthy lifestyle. Stop smoking right now. Stop heavy alcohol. Make sure diabetes, cholesterol, sugar, all well controlled, blood pressure control. As for the stroke patient survivor itself, they have to go for physiotherapies, go for exercise, make sure they take the medication as instructed by the doctor, achieve the tar 
target of the of the blood pressure, target of the cholesterol, target of the sugar. Make sure that they come to the follow up as advice. All right. Okay. Thank you, Doctor Go, right. for joining us on Medical sure. Today. Good inputs that you have shared with our viewers. Right.你可以告诉我上次你来医院中风的症状吗你可以告诉我上次你来医院中风的症状吗 你的症状感觉如何？呃，就感觉到眼睛，呃，它就OK了，就没有double那个两个因子了。走路也可以走得到，啊，就可以走得到了。OK，很好。So，你有什么东西你要问我的吗？呃，就是听说这个中风，你说
it, the treatment in stroke rehabilitation is actually customised from patient to patient. But uh, in basic terms, we actually work in a multidisciplinary setup in which we have uh, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, and also speech therapists. But we physiotherapists, what we do, the most basic treatments that we actually do will be exercise therapy, which involves stretching, strengthening, and also uh, balance, balance control in which after stroke, you see patients have a lot of impact balance when they are walking or sitting. We also help them uh, rehabilitate that part of it. And then we have uh, something called electrical stimulation, uh, electrotherapy actually, in which we actually use a device which is called EMS, electrical muscle stimulation, which helps re-educate the muscles. Lastly, most importantly, it's uh, patient education and also carer re-education, in where we actually teach them after life after stroke, what happens after stroke. That was a very interesting take on uh, managing stroke patients, a neuroscience segment for you, hosted by Nurata Amin, speaking to Dr. Ko Kwang Hee, a resident consultant in neurology and internal medicine. We also spoke to a patient, a strokey, and Hamzwani, who's a physiotherapist, all talking about managing stroke patients. Stay with us. We're going to come back just after a break, right here on episode 10 of Medical Today. I have a vision correction number, but I'm more than a number. When I'm not sharing ideas with my colleagues, I'm defending my kingdom on the back of a dragon. My eyes and lenses go beyond my correction. They keep my eyes relaxed to stay focused and protect me from harmful blue light. I'm more than a number. I'm the never tired dragon eye. Eyes in. Ask your eye care professional. See more. Do more. Essilor. a vision correction number, but I'm more than a number. When I'm not teaching courses, I'm taking steeper grades and tight corners. My SLR lenses go beyond my correction. They make my vision as sharp as my reflexes to capture every detail from near to far at any speed. I'm more than a number. I'm a rapidly focusing champion of courses. See more, do more. SLR. Ask your eye care expert for advice. Welcome back to segment four of Medical Today, right here on episode 10, uh, season two of, uh, of course, uh, Medical Today. Now, uh, in our last segment, we usually bring you a video, and this video is put together by Makota Medical Center in Malacca. And as always, if there's a situation of emergency, please call 999 first. Today's videos in Accidents and Incidents uh, delves into wound dressing. Let's take a look at this video. This is a demonstration on wound dressing. Here is the step-by-step -step instruction. Number one, prepare the standard dressing items, which are sterile gloves, apron, mask, non-sterile gloves, dressing set. Ensure patient is in a comfortable sitting position. Wear apron, mask, and latex gloves to remove patient's wound dressing. Perform hand hygiene. Open the outer layer of dressing set. Perform hand hygiene again. sterile gloves. Perform dressing. 
use correct aseptic technique while doing the dressing. Clean the wound from clean to dirty area without touching other areas. Discard all used dressing items, then remove gloves and mask. After removing gloves, Discard all used dressing items and masks. Lastly, perform hand hygiene as it is the single most effective action to reduce infection. That was a very interesting video on accidents and incidents, uh, something we bring you on a weekly basis, brought to you by Makota Medical Center in Laka. But in any case, if you do have a first aid situation or an emergency situation, you have to dial 999 first. On that note, if you do have any questions for us, do send us an email, send it to ask ask and medicaltoday.my and we'll be more than happy to answer your question or to get subject matter experts or doctors to come uh, interview or talk about anything you'd like us to talk about. Just to give you a heads up, in episode 11, we'll be talking about IVF and laparoscopic surgery in common gynae diseases. Joining us then will be Dr. S. Selva, resident consultant, obstetrician and gynecologist, and also a patient, Ms. Lee Siu Fa. They'll be both talking about IVF and laparoscopic surgery in common gynae diseases. On that note, I'm Jared Ratnam signing off. You have a great day and a fantastic week ahead. Bye-bye.